It's the Weekly Wrap with your host, broadcasting legend Bruce Wolf, and his trusty sidekick, comedian Tim Slagle. And now, without further ado, Bruce Wolf. Bruce Wolf, Tim Slagle on the Weekly Wrap, and now it's the favorite part of the show. Uh, oh, wait. No. Oh. Oh. No, Tim. Tim got a paying gig this week. <laughs> he did, but. Yeah. I have- I say guess what his background would be because I have a guess and the image of what I think it would be. Interesting. Well, I think it's uh, probably Kamala Harris pointing her Glock at all those independent <laughs> voters. Am I right? Uh, not a bad one, but my guess, he's, you know, I don't think he reads the rundown because half the time it's not from the rundown. So I okay. think, and he's kind of a geek when it comes to some of that Elon Musk space stuff. Oh, so sure. Yeah. That. That uh, rocket. Oh, yeah. Landing. I think that would, is that, that would the most I saw that on video a couple of days after it. It was like, even though I knew that it was going to happen, that it was going to yeah. catch it. I was still like, is this going to land somewhere? <laughs> I couldn't incredible. believe it was done. Yeah, pretty incredible. I mean, when you think of like the Challenger and all those space shuttles that blew up and <laughs> this guy I and, and granted, I mean, Elon Musk is crazy, but two great things. This Well, Tesla's great that's three uh the other is this, he maybe not my g- g- generation or yours but we're going to mars thanks to him and um and of course the other thing is is twitter x oh my goodness i mean that's my lifeblood as you well know <laughs> yes yes it's your so internal so monologue was, exported <laughs> so i was i was uh all set to debate tim First of all, save that picture of Pritzker and uh, Rahm Emanuel together because <laughs> in Japan, because, you know, that's a natural for the joke of the week. Yes. Uh, if and when Tim comes back, because for all we know, I mean, he's he's going to be stuck in some voting line in Michigan uh, and, and being discriminated against at, at, <laughs> for the for the for the rigged election in Michigan. Um, but although he lives, he lives in Indiana now. Right. Okay. Yeah, he lives in that. North so, Florida. but I was all set. To, uh, you know, we we have this what's become like a weekly thing where Tim and I did have our civil war roundtable, modern version, arguing the legitimacy of the 2020 election. And uh, you know, I was I'm not prepared now, so don't don't test me. But I was prepared to uh, first of all side with him in a way because there's an article a couple of weeks ago by John Fund the National Review about how immigrants could be registered and shouldn't be and there could be a problem with that okay granted um also but just on, on my side which is the non-conspiratorial uh conspiratorial side uh you know one of the arguments in, in, in favor of saying the election was rigged in 2020 is that the rejection rate of mail-in ballots was lower than usual but then there's other data that shows that it wasn't but we'll get into more data things, more on the right wing side coming up when Alderman Ray Lopez comes in. We'll talk about crime statistics in the next uh, couple of segments after this one. Yes. And then we got Dolby, da, 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 Dolby Maxwell to talk about. Well, you know, Nonsense. the over on. Excuse me. Nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> but uh, how many minutes into the segment will we just be reduced to talking about 1960s wrestlers? So <laughs> over under I mean, is is probably 45 seconds. I think 45 seconds because and I'm not talking about, you know, the wrestlers that everybody knows, like Hulk Hogan and you know the big WWFs and then WWEs. I'm talking about, you know, the world champion of Idaho, Vern Gagne, that kind of stuff. <laughs> All right. So let's get to the politics real quickly. So I don't know about you, Chris, but I, of course, you know, doing this job the way I do it, uh, did not see the Kamala interview with Brett Baer. Did you see it at all? I watched the whole thing. Oh, good, good. Oh, so I'm the one who'll talk about it. You could just listen. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so well, my wife watched it, and all of a sudden, she's the journalist criticizing Brett Bear because she says she he never asked her how she's going to pay for all this stuff. And I my, I can understand it though from what I read. Brett hardly got in a word edge wires as my late aunt Sandy would say, uh, but. You know, she she used that gambit that she's used, she's used so often. I'm speaking now, and then of course follow it up with gobbledygook. Nothing. <laughs> that is her go-to. Yes. I'm speaking, and then she'd go 
to Twas Brillig and the Slithy Toves, the guy and Gimble in the Wave. Um, and then she also has that fallback that she took that position. I was reading this in uh, Noah Rothman's piece in National Review. She uh, take the position that, uh, oh, that was five years ago when I believe that. And, you know, she's almost like a, reinforcing a stereotype of the fickle woman <laughs> okay i i'm i'm entitled to change my mind well i mean hey you can make the same argument against jd vance i mean how, you know trump was hitler uh, a few years ago and now he's he's had the metamorphosis but somehow he pulls it off with greater aplomb than she does uh i don't think this necessarily moved the needle uh just based on my reading of a couple of tweets what uh, what's you, your view what did your wife you aka your wife think of that the um, Brett's what? always looking. <laughs> AKA is not me. That's my. Well, I don't have a fake wife. Well, but, it, but that's the opinions you're giving. The so yeah. you, Brett's always looking to his right because her handlers are are keep kind of interjecting and you see oh, okay. turn away, and they kept changing like right before they're changing the. He, he spoke about this. They kept changing the parameters. It was a half hour. It's down to 23 minutes. Oh. Started later than they want to. It wasn't going to be able to be on in the time when he's on because they had to record it early. Right. And they right. were trying to push it. And then they cut the time after they pushed it to be later. And he said they were just, it was like they were trying to ice the kicker. He felt like they were trying to to screw with him and make him cut questions at the last minute that he thought he was going to be able to ask and things along that line. I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's, <laughs> and when all is said and done, uh, you know, she got bupkis out of it, which is a legal term of art, meaning no. So uh, I mean, I, I didn't I didn't think she did horrible. There's yeah. this there's this uh, old Reagan speechwriter that had the said that dominated Brett Bear. This was the headline for uh, Newsweek. Kamala Harris dominated Brett Bear. There's absolutely <laughs> that did not happen. I don't know who well, I mean, because this is how everybody. You know, everybody has his or her point of view and they, they and you could practically write this stuff before uh, before before the interview. But, you know, I was thinking I don't know nothing about politics, but uh, it, it sounded like desperation by Harris. And I was thinking, Brett, and I, I said I wrote this before that happened, that he was going to be gracious to her, which he was right. I, because I thought he Brett, was that there and there were there would be like a mutual respect. And she thinks if people would just listen to the music, not the words, that she could woo a deplorable or two, or at least an independent. So, you know, it just it's it just not you, you don't really don't want to listen to the substance, because if she were the smartest person in the world and she's far from that, she would have a hard time pulling off this campaign because she's got the Biden record stuck to her. And what's what's the point? So <laughs> it just and she's got her own record which is way off the cliff. And nobody believes that she's going to change things when she uh, if and when she gets elected. So, um, you know, I like I say, I don't think it, it really it really did much. Um, we could. Uh, so let's let's take a look at this. There was this tweet by Greg Harris uh, about uh, Tim Waltz talking about J.D. Vance. It's kind of interesting. You know, Tim Waltz was trying to uh, portray Vance as some sort of venture capitalist elitist. You're trying to Mitt Romney the guy. All right. And uh, yeah, Walt said J.D. Vance is a venture capitalist cosplaying as a cowboy. I don't even know what a venture capitalist does. It's interesting, but he knows what the word cosplay means. How many <laughs> how many people how many people, you know, who, he, you know, he's trying to appeal to in his uh, lumberjack shirt. I lumberjack and I'm OK. I work all night and I sleep all day. On Wednesdays, I go shopping and I like to wear women's clothes. Something like that from uh, Monty Python, but he's, um, yeah, yeah, he he gives it away. Actually, Tim Walls is is such a he's actually a pretty good liar, don't you agree? I mean, he tries to portray himself as a knucklehead, but then, uh, you know, oh, Tiananmen Square, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I I'm a knucklehead. Uh, oh, I called myself a sergeant major even though I wasn't <laughs> stealing valor. or that. I am a knucklehead. I just don't know what I'm doing. I like when someone then, said uh... like, it kind of gives it away. Someone said he's Elmer Fudd cosplaying as a uh, vice presidential candidate. <laughs> okay. He wishes he were Elmer Fudd. Yeah. He really he really isn't. I mean, uh, we're going to talk with Dolby about that, the, the gun situation. But uh, but yeah, I almost I think he almost blew off his uh, testiclers uh, when, load he, when, a gun. He was, when he's loading the gun there. So um, meantime, 
All right, let's move on to Jonah Goldberg had a tweet about what I roughly reduces to uh, Stephen Moore is a whore. You know, Stephen Moore, great guy. Uh, uh, anyway, Goldberg says he turned he tuned into Hannity for the, for the first time in years, caught David Asman and Stephen Moore turd polishing Trump's protectionism like they're on his payroll. Depressing. Well, you know, we used to interview Stephen Moore uh, every week on WLS Radio. Dan Proft and I did it. And I, yeah, I would place the over under at 30 seconds in which I'd get him to give that hearty laugh he has. And he's a real smart guy. He was apparently almost fed board worthy. But I, I got tired of talking to him. And not his fault, because radio shows are like lazy Susans, as Steve Dahl once told me. You just keep spinning them around till you get to the uh, potato salad again. So in recent years, I did sub on AM560, The Answer, with Amy. And they had Steve on every week. And I wanted to quiz him on something CNN had barbecued him over. But uh, being only a sub, I didn't want to queer the deal that Dan Prompt had with him, which is the reason I'm glad I don't sub anymore. But anyway, I did once ask Stephen Moore about Ricardo's theory of uh, comparative advantage, which roughly says that, hey, your country does its thing. Other countries do their thing. There's mutual uh, advantage that way. Don't go in for protectionism. It doesn't help. I mean, if you remember, Donald Trump used to go on Oprah and this is in the 80s. And he said, we got to worry about Japan. (laughs) And well, where's Japan today? Uh, Their protectionism killed them. And they don't and they're in in real dire straits because they don't have any people anymore. Somebody tweeted the other day. uh, There's no homeless people in Japan. There are no people in Japan there. It's an aging population. They've got no immigration. uh, And uh, it's kind of like they're committing Harry care. I think Rahm Emanuel will be the last man standing in Japan. And, you know, he doesn't stand very tall. Bruce Wolf sands Tim Slagle on the weekly wrap. Alderman Lopez is next. Bruce Wolf, Tim Slagle on the weekly wrap and substituting over the two segments for the uh, actually working Tim Slagle this week is uh, Alderman Ray Lopez of the good old number 15 ward. Thank you, Alderman, for joining us once again. We always appreciate it. Thank you. Always a pleasure for being here. Although, you know, the first time you were on with us was really it's going to be hard to top that because I think you were in planes, trains and automobiles doing <laughs> the segments that we were doing. It was great. Alderman on the run. It was terrific. You know, that usually has a very different connotation, by the way. <laughs> right. And it's in Chicago, of course. Chicago. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You know, my, my grandfather, like his guy's sponsor was Bernie Neistein back in the, I mean, talking about the 40s or 50s or, or whatever. I'm familiar with all that. We, you know, we haven't lived in Chicago per proper since 1958 but i'm familiar with the city and all, and all the streets and uh, and somewhat familiar with the 15th ward as well so let's start with this um there's a tweet by uh, this friend of mine scott bertram and it was and it's he noted what a lot of people have been uh, taking a look at recently the whole uh, no uh, cash bail thing and and the consequences after a year in illinois and uh, there was this quote in the first 50 weeks uh, of, of this program out of 90,872 cases, defendants missed court 67,416 times. This includes defendants charged with violent felonies. Um, a, what do you think of this? B, I guess as a preface, I mean, what what's the normal miss rate? I wonder, uh, you know, even before this program. Well, just think what would happen if you, as a criminal or a suspected criminal, arrested criminal pending trial didn't show up, what would happen? You'd have a ward put out for your arrest, a bench warrant for failure to show up. And now because of the Safety Act and everyone who's in love with criminals, you get a nice postcard. So I guess it's a boon for the USPS that we're sending out 64,000 postcards now um, for for, for failing to show up. But I mean, when two thirds of criminals know that getting arrested means nothing, not showing up to court means nothing, what do you think the outcome is going to be on the streets when when that's the mindset that that takes root in these criminals. Now, I'm trying to understand the rationale behind the legislation, because I would you would think <laughs> that, it, well, in exchange for, uh, you know, getting getting rid of the uh, cash bail, that then the defendants would, you know, the quid pro quo or something that would be on the hook for showing up and that you wouldn't yeah. just get a postcard. You'd you'd have a warrant. Yeah. Even more so than you had under the old system, because you're, it's the honor system among thieves, I guess. One would 
think that, you know, best case scenario in the land where unicorns and rainbows exist, that yes, <laughs> the honor system amongst thieves would, and criminals would work. Clearly it does not. And especially is not motivating our judges to hold people who are dangerous behind bars, as we've seen recently in my ward, where individual who was out on parole committed three, you know, felonies in a week, stealing ATMs, no less, and didn't even have his parole uh, revoked. Uh, but I think that, you know, look, I get the premise of no cash bail because you don't want to have somebody who does a stupid mistake for the first time in his life, sit behind bars because he, he can't make bail. I get that. And and there's some logic to that for a first time, probably never going to happen again. But what we've seen is that's not 97, that's not 92,000 people who are first time criminals. A lot of these are repeat career criminal people who know how to manipulate the system, who are preying on all the lefties' sympathies and hoping that everyone with guilt privilege will continue to make excuses for them so that they can continue terrorizing neighborhoods in ways that we haven't seen in a long, long time. Well, I guess you know, I'm trying to play the devil's advocate here because, you know, we got about seven more minutes in the segment. But I guess, um, you know, you got to break a few things to make an omelet. Of course, Orwell said, whatever, what happened to the where's the omelet? But the <laughs> you've got, you know, it, it, it's akin to the argument of the migrants coming over. And well, you know, their crime rate is lower than the American crime rate. Of course, you know, that's is that what we're shooting for? <laughs> so you actually have, you know, you, you mentioned this anecdote. You know, my old partner, Dan Proft, would say anecdotes aren't data. Uh, how in, in, uh, yeah, you get a bad situation where, you know, some ATMs are stolen, maybe even worse crimes are committed because of this. But I saw Kim Fox, the outgoing state's attorney uh, on the year, year anniversary of this, and she was lauding the program. So, uh, yeah, well, I mean, any anything that Kim Fox praises is is a pile of steaming crap anyway. Um, um, can I quote you on that? <laughs> you can absolutely quote me on that because it's a hundred percent true. Um, and and let's be let's be serious about something when it comes to this. Yeah, I gave the the anecdote, and Dan Prof would quote me anecdotally on my anecdote. <laughs> oh, now we're getting meta here. I, I, I don't even understand what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm trying to relate to people who wrote that law, just throwing out words at this point. Sure. <laughs> um, but, you know, I understand when you can make that argument. But the fact remains that a majority of the people who are involved and in manipulating this law are not those people. And this is what happens in reverse when you blanket people with with one paintbrush and in any yeah. other situation we tell people don't make broad de broad determinations on people in this fashion you don't do it in race don't do it in gender don't you know you have to take people for where they at unless it's criminals and you want to enable them and apologize for them and you want to make excuses for them then it's okay to paint everyone as just a victim of circumstance who if given the opportunity will always do the right thing and apparently you know 64,000 of them don't know how to do the right thing and show up for court <laughs> Um, but I mean, you know, it, it's just at some point we have to have the ability to say enough with the nonsense. We have to tell the, you know, to be perfectly frank, the white apologists and enablers on the north side who think that all of this is great, but don't know how to 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 control their their messiah complexes when it comes to dealing with their their, <laughs> their black and brown. I'm sorry, that's left out loud <laughs> messiah complex okay <laughs> um but am i wrong because no, when no, they have no. something to say about my communities or communities that i represent they always seem to know better than i do oh, like sure the spotters the safety act and i mean police funding and all oh, stop that. it now all you're that. piling on I, so, I know. Uh, I'm, so i'm gonna break for not, so, so I I gonna, I, keep going. <laughs> let me understand this this program all right so you get the postcard but then surely, and, and I won't call you surely, but then yeah. you you get the postcard and then you don't show up. <laughs> then I assume they're after you and they, they, they shackle you. Is that what happens? Well, assuming you gave the right address for your postcard. <laughs> they get that piece of paper that's about this size. Say, oh, look, court. <laughs> that's it. 
And I did, tore that paper yeah. for effect. So I'm pretty sure that's even if they even look at it to see uh, that they have to be somewhere. What if you what if you commit a crime while you're out? Uh, that's really got to sting, right? I mean, it's, there's there's got to be severe consequences for that, right? So I can I can say because I've seen it firsthand that because of both the cash bail and the pre-trial uh, detention aspects of, of the safety act. No, it's not an automatic given. And the fact that the state's attorneys have to articulate why someone on a three prong uh, uh, argument is a clear and present danger and will likely not change even if they are uh, put on electronic monitoring. And you have to go through this whole rigmarole to, right. to prove that someone who's a criminal and oftentimes a repeat offender is going to repeat again every single time just shows the the sheer stupidity of what we're of what we're doing now and in the judicial system and i've heard it when officers have been shot i heard it when on uh officer luis huesca was killed um yeah. and there was at one point a, a real concern that we had that that young shooter was going to be let go oh because my. they were making an argument that well you know it wasn't his intention to kill someone he was just a, a, a crime of opportunity so he's not really a danger and, and as you're sitting there listening to this, you have to remind yourself that there are actually judges that believe yeah. this and will fall for this BS argument every single time it's presented uh, because of the privilege guilt complex that people have in this county. We are, uh, you know, the uh, definition. I know you're not uh, you're not Jewish, uh, but uh, the definition of chutzpah <laughs> is the uh, is the kid uh, who kills his parents and then throws himself on the mercy of the court because he's an orphan. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, anyway, moving on a, just a little bit uh, uh, as a corollary to this. So um, uh, Andy McCarthy, National Review, has this uh, this tweet, and it's ripping David Muir. I don't, I don't know if you saw the, the debate in which David Muir was fact-checking wrong. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's really bad when you – it's okay. Okay to fact check, but when you fact check wrong, which also had happened to the CBS duo as well, they fact checked uh, uh, JD Vance, JD Vance wrong. But 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 Muir told Donald Trump, and you know everybody knows Trump's an idiot, right? So Muir said, "Oh, the FBI crime statistics show that crime is down." Well, actually, crime is yeah. up, and, and the FBI <laughs> doesn't do statistics; it does crime, and. And and but by the way, this this stuff was known before uh, th this latest uh, J crime stats uh, thing came out. Trump was right. <laughs> crime is is up. But the myth per perpetrated by the rapidly declining uh, in credibility uh, mainstream media is that is that crime was yeah. down. If, if I'm not mistaken, they try to say to the former president that crime was actually down about two percent or something along those lines <laughs> right which, um, which it might have been year to year from 20 to but the trend was was still up but actually the trend was four and a half percent increase um because, right 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 yes right there was six percent which is actually more than six percent right right sure so, I mean, it, yeah it, but to your point yeah it, it's remarkable that you have the media which should be the the ultimate fact checkers on people, business, and politicians have basically sold themselves out as just extensions of the narrative from whomever their master of the moment happens to be. And we see that locally here in Chicago, you see it at the state level, and you're seeing it play out fully on the national level where you have this aversion to just simply asking hard questions. And if you do, you either A, have to edit the answers to make the uh, interviewee look good. As we saw with 60 Minutes, I think that was that that changed the Kamala Harris responses. And oh, sure. The Whitaker interview. Yeah. Sure. Edit to them so that it didn't sound as incoherent as it did. Um, or you're seeing that in, in some of the other uh, situations like we've seen with uh, Brett Baer and uh, the vice president, current vice president Kamala Harris interview yesterday where everyone's saying that it was disrespectful to try and force her to answer, you know, a question. <laughs> You know, what is your name? Well, I grew up in a, as a middle class family. <laughs> oh, oh, and yeah. now you're doing a Saturday Night Live bit. <laughs> Bruce Wolvin, Alderman Ray Lopez on the Weekly Wrap. Bruce Wolf, Alderman Ray Lopez sitting in for Tim Walls on the
weekly wrap. So, so Alderman, uh, yeah, this segment will go quickly by, uh, and I'll forget to ask you. So, Hey, the bears won, uh, in London. And I think we got a lot of business from <laughs> London. Uh, I, th- I think, uh, what are we going to have? English leather cologne is coming in. They'll be opening a store on on uh, Michigan Avenue, and they'll be selling the English leather uh, behind the locked uh, glass cages or something like that. But um, yeah, how did it go for the mayor in London, in your view? Well, you know, I I join all of Chicago in saying that anytime the Bears have an away game, we absolutely do need to get Brandon Johnson out of the city of Chicago <laughs> for those events. Um, and, you know, clearly want to congratulate him on being able to put one new store on Michigan Avenue for the next smash and grab event that will happen. <laughs> um, and the fact that he, you know, gave himself a pat on the back. Uh, I think it was that Friday evening um, for having a new tech firm show up and going to relocate their world headquarters to Chicago and bring all of their three employees here. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Um, really set the bar for future mayors moving forward. Three, three and and I wish all of that was a joke. But the sad part is, you know, I actually tweeted that out when I saw this because I think I was the only one awake that read this article when it happened. And everyone thought that I was being facetious or just snotty in my comments. But I'm like, no, it's it's in the press release. We well, the, all three. each one of the employees could have like a floor of where Boeing was or whatever. I <laughs> I, I guess. So one hey, block the, in the West Loop each. <laughs> so hey, the Bears won. That, that's the important thing. Um. So oh, I want to show you this. It, it was interesting. Charles Murray had this, this tweet. The sociologist, I think he's a sociologist. I, he's the guy who once said. Um, Liberals should preach what they practice. You know, it's more along the lines of what you were saying before about the Messiah complex that they have. They live these lives. They don't get divorced. They have their kids. Every the families are intact. But we don't want to tell them anybody else. And it's and it's this noblesse oblige or uh, it's 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 pity. It's it's really it's really kind of awful. So he um, uh, took this picture at a gas station in an affluent part of downtown Washington, D.C. Social scientists call it an indirect indicator, in this case, of the reason the quality of life in big city America is getting worse despite falling official crime rates. And the picture is of a a trash basket at a gas station, and there's a sticker on it that says, please see the attendant for paper towels or squeegee. So (laughs) they're afraid that they're going to get lifted. At, at, at an in an affluent part of of downtown DC, uh, I remember you know the squeegee people used to be like oh you know yeah. uh, not a, a major nuisance you know along the expressways but um but that's a sign. An affluent. I hate part to see what the sign in the bathroom says. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to see what the sign in the bathroom says for the toilet paper. If you don't yeah, plan sure. ahead, you're going to be in a world of hurt. <laughs> right, bring your um, but you, but I drone yeah. <laughs> But I think that you know you see that all you see that all the time where it's this this uh, this rules for the mentality while also rationalizing why our standards are going down right you know we see time and time again and it's something we see here in our own city of Chicago where rather than address address like for example at the start of Brandon Johnson's term rather than address carjacking the mayor proposed suing. Honda and Toyota for making right. cars that could be split, right? Because it's obviously their fault that their cars are being willing per, willing participants to the carjacking and not the actual carjackers. <laughs> right. um, and it, it's this it's it's this backwards mentality that really allows folks who have this complex, who have this twisted political ideology, fanatical ideology to say what they're saying with a straight face without having to actually do anything in their opinion to try to actually affect the change. Cause they can turn around and say, look, we've introduced X, Y, and Z. We've talked about it. We've addressed it. And yet it remains. Never mind the fact that everything that they propose is, is crap garbage <laughs> um, like this. Um, yeah. But yet it makes them feel good. And, and as long as they feel good in politics, that's all that really matters. At some point though, I think voters um, get to that, tipping point where it's 
they're tired of being told to not believe what their lying eyes is see, are seeing. And they know that, you know, they are not the crazy ones that, you know, that stealing's wrong, that you shouldn't be the only one walking into a Walgreens actually paying for anything that, <laughs> that you know, all these things that we're saying are okay, shouldn't be okay anymore. And at some point I think we'll get where, if not there, we're damn near close to it. Yeah. Hey, um, I saw a tweet of yours. You were actually celebrating Columbus day. I thought that was, uh, verboten now in the city of chicago uh but uh, i was once actually in a the channel five float for columbus day this was 2006 i think the reviewing stand was longer than the parade but i still had a good time <laughs> and um but you know it's and on that of course the big news this week i guess was that and i take a little pride in this columbus turns out Partly Sephardic, Sephardic Jew. Jew. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Jew. <laughs> so, <laughs> He's the original f- New World Mensch. <laughs> the, the NWM, as we, as we say. So, um, yeah. But you're celebrating it, and and uh, you know, I remember when they they took down the Columbus statue uh, a, a few years ago, and uh, there was a like an Italian judge. A uh, Cook County judge who was fighting the protesters and everything. And I remember some liberal guy saying, oh, is this the hill you want to really die on? Um, maybe it is, because if you don't die on that one, <laughs> you know, wh- where does it end? Well, I think that, you know, if you start looking at all of our heroes, I'm sure we're going to find things that we don't like about any of them. And it's easy to point to Christopher Columbus and say, oh, look what he did to the to to the Americas. But there's a way to do it in, in a space that is respectful and tells the whole story of what Christopher Columbus was setting out to do, what this, uh, what uh, the European powers didn't want to do, what they finally allowed him to go do, what happened since, and what we've become because of that. We would None of us would be here if it right. wasn't for him. And we forget that point. But it's like, the more you want to peel back that onion, where do you draw the line? Are you going to draw the? I mean, there are plenty of individuals who are honored on the federal calendar who have not so nice backgrounds. Okay. There are pen, plenty of people who the city of Chicago honors routinely that don't have nice backgrounds. Are we going to have a calendar with no names on it sure. simply because we're afraid or don't want to know? Or do you actually educate people? You know, and we started off with the joke about, you know, all, various aldermen in the city of Chicago. I mean, there's a great way to show just some of the craziness in our own past here, like Hinky, Hink, like Hinky Dink and Big Bill Thompson and all the rest of them, you know, aldermen who ran the red light districts, for Christ's sake. <laughs> you know, there's a great way to talk about this without having to say, well, get rid of all the aldermen in a title because somebody in the in the past did something bad. You know, you lose on teachable moments. And I think when you lose those moments uh, to teach people, that's where you start making the same mistakes. You know, as they say, if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. Um, But I think that, yes. And I will also say, too, as a a personal pride, I'm Mexican, Polish, and Italian. So I get to celebrate two heritages in one month, October being Polish and Italian Heritage Month. So I've got... Columbus Day last weekend. I got the Polish five, 5K next weekend. I'm going all out for my people. Uh, until next great. Race. All right. We, we only have like a, about a minute left here. I, you know, as an outsider, I mean, it was it was just wild to see the school board resigning en masse when <clears throat> Brandon Johnson put them in there and they still didn't do his bidding. You know, you know, it says something when your friends can't even stand next to you with how bad your policies are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're going to see what happens. The fact that the mayor thinks that, that this little maneuver that aggravated 42, me- 41 members of the city council, uh, the fact that he thinks that will not have an impact on his budget, which he's going to propose in 10 days uh, is astounding to me, considering both entities are about a billion dollars short. The city of Chicago is short 260 million this year, nearly 980 million next year. CPS is short 800 million in total now for all of next year. So it's got to come from somewhere. And I don't know how much luck he's going to have getting it through city council. Uh, Apparently it doesn't have to come from somewhere. We could just keep spending and spending and spending. And quite frankly, I think that maybe when all is said and done, the primary reason 
that Kamala Harris doesn't win because we spent and spent and spent and that caused the inflation. And that's where, why the eggs are costing more. And you can't even make the, that omelet <laughs> without the eggs. Well, that's why she wants to legalize weed. So you won't be as hungry as you thought you would. <laughs> Oh, man, I got to watch more city council meetings. I covered it many, <laughs> many years ago. But if you're if you're throwing out like, yeah, are you talking like that? In the oh, chamber? yeah, I, I never change. <laughs> Okay. Thanks so much. Alderman Ray Lopez of the 15th Ward. Bruce Wolf on the weekly wrap. Bruce Wolf, no Tim Slagle on the weekly wrap. He's got he's got a paying gig, Dobie Maxwell. He's got a fellow stand up comic. Well, that's has, better has than you and I. I. He made it may have taken a job. I'm, uh, from I'm you. selling body parts at this point. I got my kidney on eBay for seventeen dollars <laughs> for the other one. I got a hundred wow. for the good one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> times are tough bruce this is it we're down to the election time do, do, do you feel oh i I'm, I'm just wondering you know the the trickle down theory do, do, do stand-up comedians feel uh you, you know because people are spending their money on getting a dozen eggs as opposed to playing at ten dollars well, for a two drink minimum the the american economy has come down to food clothing shelter pick two <laughs> okay exactly it's pretty rough brother <laughs> all right so um i mean let's just we can start Tim has a gig though i hope it's a, it's productive. yeah no he, he, he's actually, a funny comedian yeah he is he's a great guy too a uh, little mm -hmm. bit well he, you, you you died in the wool trump guys i mean i'm a trump voter but i'm a rhino to you because mm -hmm. uh, you know i don't believe the election was rigged in 2020 but you we don't? Could, yeah there we go <laughs> okay okay hey when you know, our favorite topic, of course, is professional wrestling, now, which I remember, is not rigged either. Of course not. I remember telling my seven year old at the time, I said, please, I'm going to tell you right now. You won't believe me, but 10 years from now, or maybe even you know, a few years from now, you're going to believe that it, it is rigged. And uh, I don't think he remembers that I actually told him that back then. But um, well, are you telling me that um, Edward Carpentier stuffed the, the ballot box? Frenchman? The, in, in in 2020 is that what you're is that to what get you're his title you? shot i think he did he uh, he <laughs> took bob loose out to lunch and there was a a roofie involved next thing you know I, he's at the hammond civic center with the title <laughs> match very fishy i gotta tell you something you're doing a little mel brooks uh, anachronistic stuff because i don't think bob loose was even on the scene when edward carpentier was a professional wrestler i think loose is like a creature of, of like the 70s and 80s and Car edward carpentier is like 1965 that's well, he wrestled a long time, like like uh, like professional athletes are done by 30 wrestlers, you know, 65, <laughs> 70. You're still well, remember Vern Gagne. All you had to do was buy his powder drink or whatever. And you could still be the professional, the world champion of Idaho when you were 80, 80 <laughs> years old. I Your hair would fall out. You get a paunch. Next thing you know, you're donning the trunks going against uh, Prince Pullins. Oh my goodness! Now I want right, to take it we... to a different direction. I know we have planned material, but this tell, is tell me the different direction you want to take. No, no, it we all we all ha have the the professional wrestling. Uh, and I don't know if you can see in my in my camera if this is an audio or video. I have got a World Football League unused ticket from the 1975 season. Now, if anybody in my circle of contacts knows about the World Football League, it would be Bruce Wolf. Well, I think now, like, well, let me. Chicago had a team. Well, OK, there, Chicago's had a number of Urzats teams over the years, most notably the Bears, but they've also <laughs> had the, the Cardinals. There was the Chicago Wind. There was the Chicago Fire, which George oh. Allen was the coach of. And I remember interviewing him after a game in like on Mother's Day one year and there was nobody at Soldier Field. And he said with he deadpanned. Well, you know, Mother's Day is big in Chicago. <laughs> OK, <laughs> thank you, George <laughs> Allen. Uh, but what? What team was in the World Football League? This is the Memphis Southman unused <laughs> ticket game one of the 1975 season. Guess how what the, the ticket was for a prime seat at the Memphis Stadium? Oh, I'm six dollars. Bingo. Oh, my. <laughs> outstanding. Well, it's six dollars. Well, you know, I used to uh, I used season to scalp. Tickets. I used to scalp uh, World Football League, you know, uh, tickets on the site. Do you do you even know what the name of the Chicago franchise was? It, it was it was the fire. But in Memphis, when they played, it was the far. The oh, Chicago there you go. far. There you go. Yeah, it was the Chicago fire. But well, that was, I think the win, too, was after that because they had about six different owners. Can you 
Um, do you have any other tickets in there? Perhaps. Yeah. Uh, well, I have an ABA a San Antonio Spurs ticket. I, just I was thinking like maybe to see um, at the Mill Run Theater a Joan Rivers opening for Bill Cosby, which I actually did see. Oh, at, at the Mill Run? Okay. Was it was a, was a good show. You, I mean, that's there. Well, I mean, Joan Rivers like was this up and coming comedian mm -hmm. at, the, at the time. And I mean, I don't think she was like drug worthy for Bill Cosby. That's a pretty bad joke I just tried to make there. Uh, let's edit it out. Our but, crack uh, staff of technological whizzes will get this smooth. <laughs> exactly. I'll be edited all the way out. Nothing I say will be in the final cut of tonight's broadcast. I, okay. So, well, we could get CBS to do that for you, uh, like they do it for Kamala Harris. Uh, they, they can do it for you. So, um, speaking of of, of ad, Democratic ads, which we weren't, but did, have you heard or, or seen this Men for Kamala ad? I, I did. Uh, Chris, your producer, told me to watch it. I had already okay. seen it. And uh, this is like Jimmy Kimmel's writers. It's their idea of who a man is. And, you know, they're these guys. Um, a morbidly say, obese cowboy. <laughs> they say I eat carburetors for breakfast and things like that. Sure. Of course. Uh, even the, does anybody even have a carburetor anymore? Uh, Is it a fuel injection? Not in but, this town. <laughs> right. But um, I've got a daisy wheel printer if that helps you. OK, I just <laughs> um, I love when they try too hard and, and people can see right through it. Sure. It's, uh, you know, I just. I, I had a news director at, at Channel 32 once who was trying to impress somebody uh, during the Bears season in 2006. And he said, oh, we're all doing the Super Bowl shuffle now. Well, no, no, that's not how a Bears no. fan would talk. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I somebody trying a little too hard. Yeah, I mean, what, I what's your so, feeling it, about yeah. that? I mean, they're they're kind of grasping at straws at this point, don't you think? It at this moment, you know, I think I th it sounds like desperation. I mean, you keep hearing about these internal polls. And of course, I always wonder why. Why are the internal polls better than the public ones? And the public ones, I guess, sometimes could be just skewed by the by the outfits that are doing that, which are, are, are kind of biased to begin with. But, the, you know, the candidates really want to know <laughs> what's going on. And it just seems like she went on Brett Baer, for example, because she was in, she's in trouble. And uh, it, it's interesting. They had this joy vibe going f when they dumped Biden unceremoniously. And now it seems to have petered out. And uh, I mean, I I could be totally wrong about this, but I, I just think Trump's going to win, don't you? I thought he won last time, but what, I guess we didn't. Put, <laughs> I don't see how Joe Biden can sit in his basement and get eighty-two million votes. I, I well, don't but know. That, uh, see, I you're not you don't watch uh, or you're not on this show every week. When no, I'm not. Know, we have this what I call our, our modern day civil war roundtable discussion, where I argue with Tim Foyle Slagle that, uh, um, that you name. know over over uh, and that that isn't that raises a reasonable suspicion how how does biden do that when obama was so popular and I, I mean, there's a simple answer to that i mean people just hate trump so much and that's why they were voting that way but it, it does trigger you know reasonable suspicion but then you, you, i mean you got to show you know the ballots being rigged and stuff like that but i i we've gone over that before and i i surrender because i just don't want <laughs> I just don't want to argue. No, no, I'm not trying to yell at you. I just, I, I had a friend of mine who worked at the campaign in, in Milwaukee and the ballots showed up at two o'clock in the morning and they were all for Biden and president only. And, and this is a person that had no reason to lie to me. So this is like the day I, after it's like, it very I, suspicious. You got to show you, th those ballots should have been investigated. They may well have been for all I know. I know that there were even conservative outfits in Wisconsin that investigated this. I know right now our, our, my producer, Chris, our producer, Chris, is is, is fuming. Uh, oh, I don't, so, so let's go in every direction. Let's... <laughs> so, no, that's fine. How about fine. Uh, how about Wink Martindale? You think he'll make a comeback? <laughs> is he still alive? I doubt it. Yeah. He, he went to the big green room in the sky. Those guys all have young voices, even when they're about to die. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like it's like they have these wonderful, beautiful young voices. And then, you know, you see them and they're they look like Jimmy Carter you know, right now. Have you, <laughs> have you seen him lately? Now, uh, that I think was vote fraud because I don't see how he you know managed to actually vote on you know on the stretcher that way but somehow he did i think virgil carter had a better chance of being a better I, I, president. you know good old number 15 
Mm -hmm. uh, Virgil Carter. We are we are showing and for those of you actually watching him, Wink Martindale, which looks like he's not only Botoxed his face, but his hair as well. It's like, it's hard oh, to do. <laughs> yes, that's not his real name. You know, he his real name is uh, Twitch Martindale. He yeah, right. It actually, it's the real name because I'm looking at the uh, Wikipedia segment on him. And it's Winston Conrad Wink Martindale. Well, that you know that that makes sense. Um, sure. And does it say that he died? Uh, no, he was born in 1933. Oh my goodness! But he's uh, according to this Wikipedia entry, uh, I, I don't see any death notice for him. As they say in Berwyn, thirty tree. Yeah, <laughs> right. All right, let's talk. Uh, you wanted to talk a little sports at all? We'll talk anything. I'm minute, here for you. So. Are I, you, I am your because uh, uh, you're wearing your Brewers hat and I'm you know, your Skitch still, Henderson. I did wear my Brewers throwback hat. Yeah, throwback, and they lost. They lost to, to the Mets, and the Mets are going to lose. Uh, I just like want Craig Council to to experience the third level of hell for leaving his hometown team to go not only mangle the Cubs, and we got a great manager in Pat Murphy. So I think uh, Craig. Well, Council and the thing is, is well, I mean, I, I I'm sure the forty million he got over five years will will console him. But they didn't have that great a season this year. Um, are you so? Uh, are you a Packer fan, actually? G for Jesus, baby. Okay, yes, and I I look. I'll, okay, we'll get really inside the football here because I have two uh, players, two quarterbacks, Caleb Williams in fantasy and uh -huh. Jordan Love, and I've started Williams all season. Can't start him this week because of the bye week. Bears have a bye, right? Can't. So here comes Jordan Love, and people have I have people told me that they think it's the most stupid thing in the world that the Packers dumped all that money on Jordan Love based on just a few games last year. Your view, sir? Uh, well, I think in the NFL you have to do that, and they brought him up the right way. They drafted him, let him sit for three years like they let Aaron Rodgers sit, and Brett Favre didn't sit for three years. I think uh, you had to do it. What, are you going to let him get away? Well, who else are you going to draft? I mean, the right, Bears have mangled it so badly. More important question, who was number 24 on the 1966 Green Bay Packers? Willie Wood. 26. Herb Adderley. Uh, 66. Ray Nitschke. Um, 15. Um, Zeke Bradkowski. No, Bart Starr. 56. Tommy Joe Crutcher. Oh, man. 84. Carol Dale. Now do uh, uh, Ray, the announcer, Ray. Ray Scott. Uh, Ray Scott, Ray Scott announcing a boy dollar touchdown, please. Oh, I, I it's he, no, he's very, very straightforward. Yeah, do I mean, it. I, I, I can't, I can't do it. You do dollar it. touchdown. That's Ray Scott. Right, I was saying, yeah, very <laughs> concise. All right, hey, we hit wrestling talk three seconds in, and that's what my goal was. Thank you so much, Doby. We'll that's see you it. after Trump wins. Okay, you got it, Bruce Wolf. Uh, 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 Doby Maxwell. On the Weekly Wrap. Go Packers. And that's the Weekly Wrap on radio and television. Follow Bruce at Bruce Wolf Shy on Twitter and Tim at TimSlagle.com. The Weekly Wrap with Bruce Wolf, a CP Pods production.